Hi, for those of you I haven't met, I'm Dr. Lauren Macaluso. I'm a partner physician in Allied Physicians Group and a breastfeeding medicine specialist. I'm also an American Academy of Pediatrics co-chapter breastfeeding coordinator for New York AAP Chapter 2, covering Long Island, Queens, and Brooklyn. The AAP recently updated the policy and technical report on breastfeeding and the use of human milk on June 27, 2022. I have been asked to, and my goal is to condense, share insight, and help you to incorporate these evidence-based breastfeeding recommendations into your practice. It's pointed out in the updated policy that breastfeeding is used throughout the document, and I will use it during this video as well. However, the word breastfeeding itself may be triggering and less accurate for gender diverse parents. The Academy of Breastfeeding Medicine, also known as the ABM, has a position statement and guideline from 2021 on infant feeding and lactation related language and gender that affirms language should be as inclusive as possible when discussing infant feeding. There's a table in this ABM statement with suggested terms in breastfeeding and human lactation, such as lactating parent and human milk. We can support gender equality and health equity for lactating parents with awareness and use of our patient's affirmed terminology. The AAP recommends exclusive breastfeeding for about the first six months, followed by continued breastfeeding. After the introduction of nutritious complementary foods, for as long as mutually desired, up to two years or beyond. There's a lot of information in that sentence. I like to break it down into three sections when discussing with parents. One, the recommendation is exclusive breastfeeding for about the first six months of life. Two, then continued breastfeeding with initiation, initiation of solids around six months. Three, and then continued breastfeeding with solid foods for as long as mutually desired by mom and child for two years or beyond. I find they can synthesize it better this way when we break it down into portions. Two years is a change from the previous AAP policy that recommended continued breastfeeding for one year or beyond. This recommendation now aligns with the World Health Organization breastfeeding recommendations and the American Academy of Family Physicians position paper. There are continued benefits from breastfeeding beyond one year, especially in the mother, with protections against diabetes, high blood pressure, and breast and ovarian cancers. The AAP has an additional policy statement from 2018 on advocacy for improving nutrition in the first 1,000 days to support childhood development and adult health, which includes breastfeeding recommendations as well. The first 1,000 days is the period from conception to two years and is especially important for neurodevelopment and long-term health. There's been confusion in interpreting the AAP's past recommendation in the wording of duration. Some physicians and families have interpreted the previous recommendation to mean breastfeed for one year and then you're supposed to stop. I've taken care of doctor moms over the years who were taught in medical school that they're supposed to stop breastfeeding and move on to cow's milk at one year of age. This update helps to recognize the normalcy of extended lactation. Mothers who choose to breastfeed beyond the first year need support as they report concealing breastfeeding to minimize unsolicited judgment. They often report concealing breastfeeding from their healthcare provider due to a perceived lack of support. As pediatricians, we can encourage and applaud mothers during our visits and acknowledge the wonderful job they're doing from the newborn to toddler stages. We can point out and cheer on the breastfeeding infant's growth, developmental milestones, and likely low frequency of infectious illness at well child checks. With awareness of the new policy update, some mothers are verbalizing a feeling of pressure to breastfeed for a longer period of time than they're comfortable with as pediatricians, we can discuss family desires and cultural variations with individual counseling. We can review the importance of breastfeeding using evidence-based guidelines and ensure that mothers and families are fully informed about their decisions. We can engage in non-judgmental conversations about the family's personal goals for breastfeeding. We can support families in the informed decisions they come to and continue to support them throughout their breastfeeding journey. This is a special time to lay the groundwork for a trusted physician and family relationship 
that will continue to grow over the years. Societal and structural barriers to breastfeeding should be identified and overcome. These include barriers such as lack of breastfeeding support services and workplaces that do not protect continued breastfeeding after return to work. To overcome these barriers, we need an educated and informed healthcare workforce that possesses the necessary attitudes and skills to help mothers meet their intended goals for breastfeeding and provides care that is inclusive, equitable, and culturally sensitive. This is something we can all do in our own practices and support our patients to achieve in their workplace. We can let them know of the New York State labor law, right of nursing mothers to express breast milk. This law allows for an employee to express milk for her child for up to three years following birth, and the employer provides a room in close proximity where an employee can express milk in privacy. We can empower our patients with language they can use to self-advocate. We can share links to the AAP policy, New York State labor law, U.S. Department of Health and Human Services business case for breastfeeding as well. We can also write letters ourselves on behalf of our patients. I've written several of these over the years, but have noticed the need has been going down over time. Key facts included for pediatric providers in the updated policy include, most infants can exclusively breastfeed without the need for supplementation. Frequent feeding on demand, at least eight to 10 times in 24 hours, decreases newborn weight loss, the need for supplements, and the risk of clinically significant hyperbilirubinemia. Continuous rooming in with frequent exclusive breastfeeding is recommended. Practitioners can avoid recommending breast milk supplements unless breastfeeding technique and frequency has been optimized first or when supplementation is medically necessary. Most mothers experience lactogenesis II or more copious milk production by the third to fourth day after delivery. Skin to skin and frequent feeding facilitate this transition from drops of colostrum to ounces of milk. The critical role that pediatricians play is highlighted by the continued recommendation that health supervision visit happens within 48 to 72 hours after discharge from the hospital or at three to five days of age. Suboptimal intake may occur Supplementation should be used judiciously while man maintaining the mother's milk supply, working up to successful breastfeeding as able, and providing appropriate referrals. Pediatricians can collaborate and coordinate care with other healthcare professionals involved in breastfeeding and lactation support. This collaboration is a wonderful part of our allied physicians group. Vitamin D supplementation for exclusively breastfed or partially breastfed infants should begin from the start there has been low compliance with this recommendation. All infants routinely consuming less than 28 ounces of infant formula per day should receive an oral supplement of vitamin D, 400 international units per day. There are one drop formulations where the lactating parent can place one drop on their nipple before eating and feeding the baby once a day. The AAP published recommendations on iron in, new, in November 2010 in the clinical report titled Diagnosis and Prevention of Iron Deficiency and Iron Deficiency Anemia in Infants and Young Children 0 to 3 Years of Age. The new AAP breastfeeding policy and technical report states that more studies are needed as delayed cord clamping has been shown to increase iron stores in healthy term newborn infants. Supplementary oral iron drops before six months may be needed in cases of prematurity, blood loss, documented iron deficiency anemia, or small for gestational age infants. It is recommended that preterm infants receive a multivitamin and iron supplement until they are eating a completely mixed diet and their growth and hematologic status are normalized. Solid foods rich in protein, iron, and zinc are recommended. We can provide guidance on iron-rich foods and iron amounts that are listed in the AAP Iron Deficiency Clinical Report. They can be pointed out to breastfeeding families to help meet the AAP recommendation of 11 milligrams of iron per day for seven to 12 month olds. Policies that protect breastfeeding, such as paid leave, the right to breastfeed in public, on-site childcare, workplace break time with a clean private location for expressing milk, the right to feed expressed milk, the right to breastfeed in child care centers, and lactation rooms in schools are all essential to supporting families and sustaining breastfeeding. 
we can do our best to advocate for these policies and assist our patients to advocate for themselves as well. We can counsel them on ways to feel comfortable breastfeeding around others. We can communicate about breastfeeding and expressed milk with their child care provider and share storage and handling guidelines. Contraindications to breastfeeding are rare. An infant contraindication is classic galactosemia. For the mother, most contraindications are infectious disease related, such as HIV in the US, and toxins such as radiation and chemotherapy. There are evidence-based resources for medications such as LactMed and for radiologic procedures from the American College of Radiology and Academy of Breastfeeding Medicine. Breastfeeding mothers should be encouraged to abstain from cannabis or tobacco use and avoid secondhand smoke exposure. Alcohol should be limited to no more than one standard drink per day, and it's recommended to wait at least two hours after the drink before nursing or expressing milk. In celebration of National Breastfeeding Month in August, the authors of the updated policy statement will be hosting a webinar titled, What's New with the 2022 American Academy of Pediatrics Breastfeeding Policy on Wednesday, August 10th from 8 to 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. I'll have links to the AAP policy and this web webinar emailed to all of you. Also, the QIC meeting on October 18th will be focused on breastfeeding. Dr. Lena Edelstein from PHA will be speaking on the theme of what I didn't know until I started learning. I will be there as well to join her for the Q&A. I hope you all enjoy the rest of your summer. Feel free to email me with questions or comments and I look forward to continued collaboration and coordination of care to help support our allied families in their breastfeeding goals. Take care.